Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. <clears throat> Today is the first Sunday of the blessed month of Abib. In this month, we focus on the apostles. And we see how our Lord supports his apostles, and he gives them authority, and he commissions them to serve the world. And so today, I'd like to focus a little bit on this calling. Christ calls his apostles. And you can see this <clears throat> willing heart, this willingness to sacrifice everything in order to follow him. And their response is amazing. It's this readiness, this courageous readiness. Christ wasn't calling them to a life of ease or, or like physical safety, not comfort. He was asking them and calling them to a life of self-denial, of service, of dying to self, even at the cost of their earthly lives. Why? so that they could enable others to attain eternal life as well. He called them to put on Christ and his church and the life of the gospel above everything. And he was preparing them to take up the cross and to spread the gospel, the good news, to a transformed life, a life with Christ. Our Lord is constantly inviting people to follow him. He might whisper it in their hearts. He might speak it through the words of the gospel. He is the great fisher of men. And he seeks to capture the hearts and the minds so that we're not held captive by the world. We're not held by the traps and the snares that have been sent by the evil one. But some people have different responses to this call. There are some people who hear the call and they delay the message. They delay answering it. They think, you know what? There's going to be this ideal time or this ideal circumstance that will allow me to take my first step. I'm just waiting for that time to happen, this milestone in life. Some hear this call and they never even think about the possibility of following the call. They can't imagine a disruption in their lives. They have plans, and they want to focus on those plans. And they can't imagine what blessings the Lord has in store for those who obey the call. They can't see it. Yet, others will completely reject the call. Completely reject it. Because they don't want their lives to be marked as belonging to Christ. But there are those who hear this call and they respond immediately. Each of us is being called. Each of us is being called. And we're called to serve in different capacities. But each one of us is being called to serve. Not everyone is called to be a deacon. Not everyone is called to be a priest. Not everyone's called to be a chanter or a reader. Not everyone's called to bake the holy bread. Not everyone's called to serve in, holy, in, in, in Sunday school. Sometimes this is a misunderstanding that the peak of service is Sunday school service. This is a misunderstanding. But every single one of us has been called to follow Christ more fully. This is our calling. If we're not sure of our calling, there is a process. We should fast we should pray about it. We should talk to our Father's confession about it. We should pray to Christ himself, saying, Lord, how can I follow you more? How can I unite my life with the life that you desire for me? How can I serve you more faithfully? The reality is, the reality is, none of us are worthy of the calling. I certainly am not. The apostles were not. The apostles were not worthy of this calling. It was obedience to the calling of God that made them worthy to know him intimately. Imagine the things that they saw and experienced when they followed Christ. Imagine what they would have missed if they chose to refuse the call. What might we miss 
by ignoring the Lord's call to follow him more fully, more fully. Better yet, maybe a more positive contemplation is, what might we gain from following his calling? Our Lord Jesus Christ desires that each one of us follows him, and he does not force us. We follow primarily through our obedience to his teachings and the teaching to the church. God does not look to disrupt our lives in a negative sense. He offers us life. And this points us to his extreme love. What does that look like practically? I'd like to go a little bit further and reflect on the teachings of St. Paul. We did, we did just celebrate the martyrdom of St. Peter and St. Paul just on Friday. It's not often that an apostle of Christ begs. It's not often. Yet this is exactly what happened in the epistle of St. Paul to the Ephesians. He writes to the Christians there, and what he says there is applicable to every place, every community, even in Chino Hills. He writes, Brethren, I, a prisoner for the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Sometimes we forget the sorts of trials and struggles that were faced by the apostles. We forget what they had must have undergone and what they went through in order to preach the gospel that we take so lightly and so casually. St. Paul reminds his listeners that he is writing this while he's in the prison under house arrest in Rome. But what's the focus and the goal during that time? It was the well-being and the care of the church of God for which he had worked day and night. Here St. Paul gives us a Christians some really important guidance, and it's important for each one of us to hear these words. He says, lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And then he goes on to describe this life. And he describes how one lives in a way that is worthy of the name of a Christian. It's not enough to claim to be Christians by title alone. It's not enough to believe that we're Christian internally. We are called to live the life of a Christian. And he tells us to do this with meekness and lowliness. What do the words lowliness and meekness mean? Lowliness is described as having a humble opinion of oneself. Having a humble opinion of oneself. Modesty, humility. So when St. Paul begs us to live a life of the Christian, he begins by turning our attention to our own demeanor, our own humility. He tells us that a Christian is one who is humble. It reminds me that the great saints of our church are truly humble people. They aren't people who judge. They aren't people who condemn not even quietly. Some people feel like we get away with it when we do this quietly. We say our condemnations, our judgments internally. No. The saints are special because they focus on their own shortcomings and they strive to repent. They don't have time to judge others because they're solely focused on how they can please Christ. That's what makes a saint so special. We're told that meekness is similar and goes hand in hand with loneliness. It also goes hand in hand with being gentle and being mild with others. So much damage is done when we are rude, when we're pushy, when we are trying to force people to do things our way, my way. It has to be my way. And we're all guilty of this at times. No one is perfect. Yet, the Lord expects us to strive for perfection. And he demonstrates gentleness 
with one another because this is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Next, St. Paul tells us that Christians must have patience, forbearing one another in love. Patience is defined here as endurance, steadfastness, perseverance, long-suffering, slowness in avenging wrongs. Forbearing is defined as to sustain or to endure. So, St. Paul is not trying to establish some new moral code. He's trying to give us a glimpse into the kingdom of heaven. And the church is the image of the kingdom on earth. The church is the place where we unite with Christ and his saints. We participate with the Holy Spirit. How can brothers and sisters in Christ who live together in Christ who is one body in Christ, in the midst of the saints and the angels, be impatient with one another. How? How can brothers and sisters in Christ be boastful, be arrogant with one another? We are reminded that while we are human, we are called, it's calling, to be holy and to be transfigured humans together with Christ. Why? St. Paul tells us that we are endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. If one person begins to act in a way that is rash or unkind to someone else within the church, what's the result? Well, it's possible that some people may be pushed away from the church. How dare we? We, as Christians, are not called to push people away from the church. That job is taken by the evil one. We are called to be like the apostles and the evangelists, and we are called to be ambassador of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Trinity, and through our living example of love, our living example of love, we don't come here simply for ourselves and what we can get. We come here in a spirit of service and of love. It's been said that the Coptic Church produces servants. We come to be with others and to share with others in this great joy, in the joy of the resurrection of our Lord. We're bound together. We are bound together. Through baptism and receiving the Holy Spirit, we're bound together and united through our participation in the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when someone holds a grudge, when someone holds a grudge against another within the community, it's a great sin. It's a problem. How do we pray the Lord's Prayer when we're holding grudges and are angry with one another? How? You see, the priest turns around to the people during the divine liturgy to ask the people to forgive him. He knows that he is not perfect. We sin. We might even offend others. So what the priest does physically when he turns around to the people should be done by each one of us Internally, through the attitudes that we have towards everyone else. In other words, we should make a low bow in our minds and our hearts to strive to serve one another because we are one family. Strive to put everyone else first. What happened to I must decrease? Strive to be united and put aside any minor differences that you might have so that we can show yourself to be faithful children of your Father in heaven. St. John Chrysostom, I'm going to share a passage. It's a little bit lengthy, hopefully not too bad. He says, The purpose for which the Spirit was given was to bring into unity all who remain separated by different ethnic and cultural divisions, young and old, rich and poor, women and men. 
And then he continues to say, Bind yourselves to your brethren. Those bound together in love bear everything with ease. If now you want to make the bond double, your brother must also be bound together with you. Thus he wants uh, us to be bound together with one another, not only to be at peace, not only to be friends, but to be all one, a single soul, one body. Beautiful is this bond. With this bond, we bind ourselves together both to one another and to God. This is not a chain that bruises. It does not cramp the hands. It leaves them free. It gives them ample room for greater courage. St. John tells us that the bond that we have to one another is powerful. It is so powerful. More powerful than any frats, any organizations. The holy bond that we have allows each one of us to grow and to be nourished in Christ as one body and one soul. So, nourish and care for the body because it will be your strength and your salvation in Christ. Saint Siloan once said, Our brother is our life. Our brother is our life. So just to conclude, the apostles, they were given no guarantees about their future. They left their work, and they didn't even know how or where their next meal would come from. They had no idea. They had great hope and great faith. But we know the power of the Messiah. We know the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we cling to our own wants and our own vision of what we could be, we're going to miss out. We are going to miss out. We are going to miss out on how, on how God wants to make you. God and His extreme love for us has died and has risen again to offer us a chance to become transformed into something, to be transformed to someone much more substantial than we could ever imagine. A chance to become a son of God by grace. It's a gift. Not simply to be called a son of God, but to be transformed through the work of the Holy Spirit, and to truly become vessels. May we follow him boldly and allow him to transform our lives. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Oh,